Member for Cochin Valley. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. It is my sincere pleasure to rise today and speak to the Professional Governance Act, and I hope that some of what I provide to this debate will answer some of the questions that have been raised by the official opposition members. The management of our province's resources impacts all British Columbians, and this legislation is a key step towards ensuring the public trust that those decisions will protect their best interests too. For too long in BC, the status quo of regulation and enforcement has led to cases, both large and small, that have impacted the health of communities and environments across the province and undermined that precious and essential public trust. The status quo, a regulatory model known as professional reliance, is a system introduced over the last 16 years that shifted the expertise and responsibility for environmental stewardship out of government and replaced it with a reliance on qualified professionals. The professional reliance model lacks sufficient oversight to ensure that our natural resources are being managed for the benefit of their economic, social, and ecological values. And it has impacted communities, professionals, and industry across the province. It was indeed these impacts that first inspired me to get involved in politics. My home is in the community of Shawnigan Lake, where contaminated soil has been deposited at the headwaters of our drinking watershed. This watershed is not only an important ecosystem unto itself, it is also the source of drinking water for thousands of people. It was these impacts that motivated me to run for office as a CVRD director in 2014. I moved to Shawnigan Lake in 2011 with my family and started teaching at what was then Dwight School, located on the shores of the lake. We not only loved living in a place as beautiful as Shawnigan, we quickly came to love the people and the community. We soon noticed signs, however, with skulls and crossbones dotted along the road edges and learned that the provincial government was considering issuing a permit to a company operating a quarry at the south end of Shawnigan Lake, halfway up a mountain that overlooked the entire watershed. The site, was Shawnigan, the site has Shawnigan Creek on its eastern edge, which feeds directly into Shawnigan Lake, and a so-called ephemeral stream, which is almost always running, on its western edge, which ultimately also runs into Shawnigan Creek. A CVRD park runs along the western edge of the quarry site, and from that park you can look down and see all of Shawnigan Lake, a lake that is the drinking water source for our community. It was astonishing to us having moved from Victoria with its fenced off watershed, which one can only visit on guided tours. It was astonishing to us that a community's drinking watershed could be subject to such degradation. In addition to the quarrying that was happening, there is significant logging within the watershed. And since 2012, a number of so-called soil farms have proliferated in Shawnigan and Mill Bay. These soil farms are lands where private owners accept truckload after truckload of dirt being removed largely from development sites in the CRD and deposited in our watersheds. We have seen landslides into riparian areas, impacts to salmon burying streams, and growing concerns about what may or may not be in these soils. But the proposed contaminated landfill was even more shocking. At a public hearing in July 2012, hundreds of people from the community attended, and all but two expressed vehement opposition to the proposed permit. The two people in favor of it, one was the daughter of the quarry owner. The other was the then chief of the Malahat First Nation, who later resigned after he had, it was revealed that he had a deal with the quarry owners. We had hope as a community that government would do what we expected of it. It would protect our environment, our drinking water, our community, and our future. That hope was dashed over and over again. First, on the Thursday afternoon of Easter weekend in 2013, we were shocked when a draft permit was issued for the contaminated landfill. It was the list of contaminants that would be permitted at the site that left us in a state of disbelief. Benzene, toluene, xylene, sterine, methyl, tertiary, butyl, ether, volatile petroleum, hydrocarbons, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, chloride, sodium, glycols. Essentially, a laundry list 
of everything you do not want anywhere near your drinking water source. We responded with vigor and determination. Over 300 written submissions were made to the ministry, all of them making the case for not allowing this permit to go forward. But, it, but go forward it did, and thus began our community's fight for the future that we wanted. There was a moment that captured for me our community's determination and desperation. It was the morning of December 15th, 2015. And that night, I sat down to write out what was happening. This is what I wrote. A message arrived in my inbox at 7.32 a.m. this morning, accompanied by a photo. Help, it said. This is what it has come to in Shawnigan Lake. A young mother, her baby strapped to her chest, and a grandfather standing together in front of a 40-ton dump truck before dawn on a cold December morning. I can't look at this image without weeping. I weep for all of the lost mornings, days, afternoons, evenings, and night. I weep because of the insanity of this situation, the colossal unfairness of it, the unbelievable injustice that is playing out day after day in this community. I weep because all of us would rather be at home in, at seven in the morning, drinking coffee with our families, getting our kids off to school, thinking about the day ahead. I weep because each day we lose more faith in the agencies that are supposed to protect us. Every morning we return to the mountain, sometimes dozens of us, sometimes only a few, but we return because the situation a company being allowed by our government to dump contaminated soil in our watershed is an affront to democracy, to common sense, to logic, and to science. And it is a threat to our survival as a community. For three and a half years, we thought we had enough to make this stop, Honorable Speaker. We thought 300 people coming to a public meeting where all but two expressed vehement opposition to the plan of putting this contaminated landfill in our watershed would send a clear message to the government and would be enough to stop this in its tracks. We thought that over 300 letters written to the statutory decision maker would be enough. We thought the opposition of the CVRD, the CRD, VHA, Cowichan tribes, and the people of Shawnigan would be enough. We thought that hundreds and hundreds of letters to MLA's ministers and the premier would be enough. We thought that nine expert witnesses at the Environmental Appeal Board hearings, including geologists, hydrogeologists, engineers, and a water treatment specialist, all of whom identified problems with the site assessment, the plan, the design, and the engineering, would be enough. We thought that over 15,000 signatures collected and presented to the Minister of Environment would be enough. We thought that 1,600 people on the legislature lawn would be enough. We thought that documenting the long-standing history this company has of non-compliance with its mines permit would be enough. We thought that documents revealing a secret agreement between the owners of the site and their engineers who were acting as qualified professionals would be enough. We thought that allegations of fraud, perjury, bribery, and misrepresentation through the entire permitting process would be enough. We thought that evidence of a breach of water off the site which resulted in a do not use water advisory for the people of Shawnigan Lake would be enough. We thought that evidence of a water treatment system that did not function as designed would be enough. We thought that ongoing documented non-compliance with the MOE permit would be enough. We thought that water samples that showed that the site is already impacting the environment would be enough. We thought that an engineering report that identifies water leaving this site is bypassing the water containment, treatment, and testing systems would be enough. But nothing seemed to be enough. In 2015, we were willing to continue to ask the Ministry of Environment to do the right thing and protect our water. And at the time, we were clear that until they decided to act on behalf of the citizens of Shawnigan Lake rather than on behalf of one company, what we had left were our bodies and our willingness to put our bodies in front of 40-ton trucks. Ultimately, over a year later, the ministry did suspend and then cancel the permit, but not before tens of thousands of tons of contaminated soil was deposited at the site and not before both the CVRD and the Shawnigan Residents Association spent millions between them on court cases. 
Why is this relevant to today's legislation? Because at the heart of the issue in Shawnigan Lake was professional reliance. The engineers who were tasked with putting a technical assessment report in front of the government statutory decision maker were hired by the quarry owners. And in July 2015, we discovered because of an anonymous whistleblower that the quarry owners and the engineers did not just have a contractual agreement, they had a profit sharing agreement. And as a community, we were shocked to discover that under professional reliance legislation, this is an acceptable situation. Supreme Court Justice Sewell, in his January 2017 decision to set aside the Environmental Appeal Board's decision and reinstate the stay on this permit, did not think it was an acceptable situation either. He stated in his decision, it is clear from the evidence that the delegate re relied on the technical assessment report and on further information provided by Act of Earth in assessing the application and deciding to issue the permit. If the question before me had been whether to set aside the permit, I would have had no difficulty in setting it aside and remitting it to the Ministry for con Reconsideration because the technical assessment report was prepared by persons who were biased in favor of approving the project. He went further in his decision. He said, Justice Sewell said, I am satisfied that the board ought to have been made aware that the design of the facility and the technical assessment report presented to the delegate was prepared by engineers who were not independent and who stood to profit from the continued operation of the facility. This is a circumstance that goes to the heart of the integrity of the approval process under the Environmental Management Act. The delegate and the board proceeded throughout on the basis that Active Earth were professionals acting on a fee-for-service basis. For me, this realization that legislation allowed for that kind of conflict of interest was, that was governing land use decisions in BC, this realization was what propelled me to want to run to be an MLA. Our community was not willing to accept the risks that it posed to our health and our future. But as we organized, we soon discovered that the problem was bigger than Shawnigan. Sadly, it has been echoed in communities and ecosystems across the province. In Peachland, residents have seen boil water advisories increase as, increase, as impacts from logging, mining, and other activities have accumulated in their watershed. In the Hulkar Valley, groundwater monitoring was insufficient in detecting water quality concerns before it became a crisis. The result was a health hazard to the community that depends on the Hulkar Aquifer for drinking water. In the community of Weimar, residents are concerned about logging in their small, already stressed watersheds. They are worried that the forest management decisions are not taking into account impacts on other ecosystem factors. Meanwhile, the Swansea Point community has experienced two devastating landslides. Residents had to bear the burden of significant costs for infrastructure repair while logging activity continues to increase. The most infamous example, Madam Speaker, however, took place four years ago in central BC. In 2014, 24 million cubic meters of mining waste flooded lakes and rivers when the mine tailings dam at Mount Polly failed. Residents of the area say they woke that morning to a sound that resembled multiple airplanes taking off at once as heavy metal mud poured into an otherwise pristine lake. The impacted watershed was an important source of drinking water and spawning territory for one quarter of BC's sockeye salmon. Four years later, although the photographs are not as striking, the bottom of the formerly pristine Quinell Lake remains lined with a mass of phosphorus. The salmon are beginning to come back, but so are inexplicable algae blooms that choke out oxygen. The impacted communities also struggle to recover. People are afraid to drink the water, and the impact to their tourism industry has prompted some residents to relocate. It will be years before we can fully understand the environmental and social impacts of the Mount Polly disaster. But what is clear from the Auditor General's report into the matter is that several failures in compliance and enforcement were contributing factors. Shawnigan, Mount Polly, and the other communities I listed are just a few examples of how our current resource management model has failed to protect the best interests of British Columbians. 
This is why when we ran in 2017, reviewing the professional reliance model was a key aspect of our platform. And it is why when we formed our confidence and supply agreement with government last year, professional reliance was identified as a key shared policy initiative. These commitments initiated an independent review into the professional reliance model, which took into consideration over 2,200 public feedback forms, 102 stakeholder submissions, and 1,800 surveys from qualified professionals. People were concerned about the state of resource management in our province, and they made their voices heard. The culmination of these efforts was Mark Haddock's final report published this summer. The Haddock Report is extensive. It covers the history of professional reliance in British Columbia, as well as the complex legal and policy framework that substantiates it. It covers issues with governance, legislation, and multiple resource industries, ultimately making 121 recommendations for change. From my perspective, the recommendations made by the report are, an import, are important and signal a shift in a positive direction. I was encouraged by the scope of public and professional engagement and by the common theme shared by the submissions that, quote, there is room for improvement. I agree. Perspectives on the shape and scope of that improvement, however, differ. For that reason, this summer, I convened two roundtables on the Professional Reliance Report. We invited stakeholders from industry, professional associations, environmental organizations, legal groups, unions, indigenous groups, and impacted communities. The purpose of our discussion was to seek input on the Haddock Report and its recommendations in a collaborative, forward-looking environment, and I was pleased with the results. The discussions prompted by the roundtables provided unique insights into the various responses to the Professional Reliance Report. Ultimately, there were more similarities between stakeholder perspectives than there were differences. Several key themes emerged from these conversations, and I'd like to take a moment to touch on them now. First, we heard that stakeholders were concerned with BC's legal landscape. They did not find that the law worked sufficiently to protect the public interest in resource management. When the former government began deregulating resource management in the early 2000s, legal groups attempted to enforce the deregulatory legislation, but with little success. Many stakeholders were also concerned about the lack of legal protection for whistleblowers, which I am pleased to note this legislation before us addresses. Stakeholders stressed that the legislative response to the Haddock Report must implement recommendations with clarity across the professional associations so that the legislation acts as an accessible tool and provides greater consistency for all actors involved. They also suggested that government set new resource use objectives, objectives that are based in scientific expertise, are easily enforceable, and that take into account economic, social, and ecological values. The stakeholders that we spoke to also highlighted that in order to adequately fulfill Haddock's recommendations, capacity is a key concern. In the public bodies tasked with professional oversight roles, it is essential that staffing levels as well as expertise are improved. Thanks to nearly two decades of deregulation, numerous positions have been eliminated, leaving those tasked with enforcement unable to adequately address the numerous concerns brought to their attention. Professionals in particular have flagged the importance of expertise. Civil servants overseeing particular professions need to have the scientific and technical knowledge to best inform their decisions. Capacity challenges also impact marginalized groups, especially indigenous peoples, those who face other systemic barriers often lack the resources and staff to fully participate in natural resource decisions. This government has committed to implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In order to do so, Indigenous peoples must be equitably and meaningfully included in resource management. The stakeholders that we spoke to also raised the importance of follow-through. In other words, in order to improve the professional reliance model in a consistent and meaningful way, we cannot simply address the first two recommendations of Mark Haddock's report. It is crucial we examine the other 119 recommendations and work to implement them to better protect the public interest and provide greater certainty for qualified professionals. 
I am pleased to see the legislation before us today, but I cannot stress this point enough. If we do not commit to the other recommendations of the Haddock Report, if we do not continue to implement positive and consistent change in resource management, then this Professional Governance Act will not be able to achieve its aims. A step in the right direction does not reach the destination. We must continue moving forward. This is what we heard from British Columbians. They are concerned, and we have the opportunity now to do better by them. This issue is about ensuring that communities can rely on and benefit from their resources for generations to come. It's about looking at things holistically rather than evaluating each resource separately from others, because we know that the water, the trees, the soil, and the air are all interconnected. It's also about collaboration. Professional associations, industry, and environmentalists are all calling for improvement and consistency. The Professional Governments Act and continued action on the professional reliance file stand to benefit all stakeholders involved. The legislation before us today sets an important precedent. It addresses two of the Haddock Report recommendations by establishing an office of the Superintendent of Professional Governance and legislating critical elements of professional governance in a standardized way. The office of the Superintendent will be built within the Ministry of the Attorney General. Primarily responsible for oversight and general governance matters, they will be empowered to conduct research into best practices and establish policies. The superintendent in overseeing the administration of this act will be able to publish information that is in the public interest and conduct investigations into non-compliance. The superintendent will also provide annual reports to the minister. This contributes to the accountability and while simultaneously ensuring that improvements to professional governance will be assessed at regular intervals along the way. All, of, of, all five of BC's professional associations, the Applied Science Technologists and Technicians, the Association of BC Forest Professionals, the BC Institute of Agrologists, the College of Applied Biology, and, and the Engineers and Geoscientists of BC will now be held to the same standards. In other words, there will not only be better government oversight of professional regulation, but professional associations can know with certainty that there are consistent guidelines for them to rely on. This helps them make the best decisions possible as they make governance decisions that impact the entire model of resource management. Professionals themselves will also be better to better perform their roles thanks to the provisions of this bill. Improved standards of conduct and competence, as well as exclusive rights to practice, will give professionals the best tools and capacity to engage in a level playing field. It shows that their work is valued not just by their employer, but by the province that depends on them. As I already mentioned, thanks to the new whistleblower protections, professionals can be confident, confident that if they report unethical, unethical conduct, their own livelihoods will not be at risk. Oaths of office, a common set of ethical principles, and a duty to report unethical conduct will also go a long ways towards the rebuilding of the trust of the public. This is a net positive for professionals, public, government, and industry alike. If we know that the decision-making process has the best interests and key values of British Columbia at heart, our industries will be more competitive and our province healthier as a whole. I do have some concerns about this act, given the significance of this issue and the breadth and scope of the Haddock recommendations. As our stakeholders stress, there is much room for improvement in resource management in British Columbia, and I remain eager not only to engage in this legislation at committee stage, but to follow its implementation. For communities such as Shawnigan, Peachland, the Holkar Valley, Wymere, Swansea Point, and those impacted by Mount Polly, Williams Lake, Likely, Horsefly, this may not be able to restore their drinking water and environments, but it may prevent future crises. We owe it to those communities and to British Columbians writ large to implement the Professional Governance Act with care for detail and transparency. As legislators, we also owe a commitment to fulfill all of the recommendations of the Haddock Report in order to restore the trust that was lost. In Shawnigan, the soil that was deposited at the quarry remains there today, and it leaves the community understandably worried. 
As I have said all along, the story of Shawnigan Lake over it, the story of Shawnigan Lake is not over until the site is cleaned up and the soil removed, and I remain committed to that outcome. The permit should never have been issued. The soil should never have been brought to our watershed. Our community and no community in BC should ever have to go through the years of worry, of turmoil, of costly legal battles as a result of land use decisions. This legislation does not ensure that, but it is a step and it is an important one. Ultimately, I am encouraged by the legislation on the table today. The Professional Governance Act does represent a significant step in the right direction, and although there is a great deal of work yet to be done in order to adequately address the shortcomings of resource management in British Columbia, I am proud to speak in, in support of this act. It is a testament to the benefits of consultation and collaboration, as well as perseverance of those impacted. Moving forward, I am hopeful that British Columbians can begin to trust that the decisions made in our province protect the economic, social, and ecological values that they hold dear. Thank you.